Okay. Uh, I also want to take an issue with something Todd said. He said that licensing isn't like the coolest thing. I, I totally disagree. Licensing is, is, and has been a fundamental part of my, my life and career. And I, I love software licenses. I, I even, even commercial ones. I, I, it's, it's, I used to give this talk about how to read a software license. Um, and it's a super fun talk and, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll re-give it seven years from now, uh, the next time I, I, I speak. Uh, okay. Uh, so I also want to uh, thank Angie, Sarah, and Martin. I couldn't have asked for a better cohort of keynote speakers. It's, it was really great listening to y'all. Um, and, and yeah, so let's get started. So first of all, before I, I get into the meat of the talk, I, I like to actually lead my uh, speeches with, uh, well, should I be paying attention to the Q and A in chat? No, it blinks too much. Um, I like to leave my speeches uh, with the most recent release of open source software from Alphabet. So uh, just 14 hours ago, our Verily division released a clinical trial simulation tool called Metis. So if you're currently planning a clinical trial for a vaccine for a, you know, a pandemic or something, uh, they put some really neat work into a set of Jupyter notebooks and tools for basically simulating a clinical trial and for planning a clinical trial. So check it out if you're interested in such things. Uh, I'll, I'll paste a link in the chat. Uh, it's, it's on GitHub under Verily Life Sciences and Metis. So, and it's under the BSD license. So what about licenses? Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about open source licenses and why it's really important that we keep them the focal point of what we do in open source. And I, I know you're thinking, I'm at an open source conference, I already like and know open source licenses, but I like to remind people about the power that these licenses have to do so much more than just let us release some code uh, or put a lens of neutrality on code. They give us so, so much more than that. And as open source has grown uh, and been normalized in companies and the rest and in how developers work, I think we've sort of forgotten how deep the freedoms offered by these licenses truly are and how far they go. So what makes open source really special when you compare to like, I don't know, commercial licensing or whatever, is how we get to work with each other. So I've been at Google for about 16 years now and people ask me, is Google still doing the open source thing? And I'm like, well, yeah, absolutely. Open source has been part of Google since the very, very beginning. And one of the reasons I have always returned to uh, open source is the primary part of my job is that uh, you know, I, I really like to return to open source people. I like people who make free and open source software so much. There are people who have a will to make things better for everyone through software and, and through computing. And I think that's really special. And it's something that I've wanted to be around and I keep being around and have been around for my entire career in, in, in computer science. And the thing that lets us work together and, and what lets us build software are the licenses. And that's why when I think of open source, I always like, whenever I see an open source news story or or a release on, you know, pick your favorite Reddit, Hacker News, whatever it might be, uh, or on Twitter, I always go, okay, but what license, right? Uh, so, because the license tells me what I can do with this code now, right? What, what I don't have to ask permission to do. So one of the first things I was asked to do at Google when I got there many, many years ago was to negotiate a license for a computer vision project with a large West Coast uh, research university whose name rhymes with Mamford. Uh, so we were discussing who gets to use what, how they get to use the software, who has to give each other what kind of resources. And it took about 11 months before we could just start coding together. And I remember thinking the entire time, like, why, why are they having the open source guy do this <laughs> negotiation? This seems like a huge waste of time. If we just had an open source project that we could just work on together, we wouldn't have to do any of this stuff. We wouldn't have to do any of this negotiation. And it wasn't that the negotiation was bad or that anyone was a bad person. It's just open source licenses take all of this and get, get, gets all this trickiness out of the way. Uh, so you know, I largely concentrate on doing just that, applying open source licenses and open sourcing stuff for a living. And it's also why Google loves open source software. We don't have to struggle bus through negotiations and waste time. We can just get to work on the things that matter. 
So open source is pretty popular now, right? And, and I'm really happy that it's become so normalized uh, in the world of software development. One of the great things about open source licenses is they tell you exactly what they mean. So when I see an Apache on a project, everything I need to know about that is, is right there in the license. I know how I can use it, I can, how I can modify it, what I have to do to distribute it. And, and everyone else has the same understanding for, for these prominent licenses. And, and it's really important. It's why I'm a huge believer in the Debian free software guidelines and the open source definition. And because they, they really mean something to me, but more importantly, it's something that belongs to all of us. So there are other licenses out there, right? Uh, and they introduce things like, you know, reselling fees or restrictions on cloud providers and all the rest. And they're not wrong or bad or evil or anything. It's just not open source. So when I say, when we say an open source project, I think it's important that we're talking about real open source software covered by a real open source license that follow the guidelines from the open source initiative and the open source definition. And these are the guidelines that help us work together. So one of the things about doing open source for a really long time is you kind of start noticing that open source has a gatekeeping problem. And sometimes it's actually pretty intentional. Someone's trying to keep other people out of their project. They just want to do it themselves. They don't want to talk to anybody else, or they want to keep it inside their company. They want to keep control over that inside their company. But sometimes it's just, we're so used to operating as we do, we don't realize we're not being inviting or welcoming to, to new, new developers and new users. So I, I can't say a lot of good things about COVID and the pandemic. But one of the things that's happened because of COVID is these events have all gone virtual and they've started attracting people who are not necessarily uh, the people who would have come to this uh, you know, conference last year or next year. So we'll get people from all over the world who are able to now attend these conferences. And, and so it's kind of a really great thing. So instead of talking to the same group of people who maybe I would have seen at a given conference last year, I'm able to talk to people all over the world. And, and here's the thing, I think that open source could be doing a lot better a job of welcoming new users. So we can avoid the unconscious discrimination now. And we can recognize the hostility of doing things the way they've always been done. We can use this time to change. Um, things like refusing to adopt a code of conduct or making an assumption that someone has time to search through and scan and scroll up a, you know, a, a, like a, a whole raft of Slack channels, right? Um, or assuming that they can work in the same time zone as, as you or within a couple of hours of your time zone. Um, and, and none of this is how we make software better together. So, so my, uh, my friend, Brian Fitzpatrick, he has this great metaphor about uh, open source projects and groups being like circles, right? Once you stand in a big circle and you, and you focus internally on this project, it's actually really, really hard for anyone to break the circle and join, right? So you have to sort of, you have to go Pac-Man, as, as Brian says, you have to go Pac-Man, you have to open up uh, your circle so there's an entry point for others to join. So we've run a couple of programs at Google that are about opening these circles. Uh, first is the summer of code, and, and the second is the season of docs. They both give people who don't traditionally work on open source software an opportunity to contribute upstream, to learn, and get involved in a project. In the last 15 years, we've had 15,000 students from more than 100 countries participate in the summer of code, and they've contributed more to 680 projects. And we're in our second year of the season of docs, and that's mentoring 80 uh, technical writers this year, and they started with 44 last year. So we shouldn't stop there, though. Everyone should be thinking about how their projects can bring in new users and contributors. You know, uh, Sarah was talking about uh, Vue.js. One of the things, so I, I, I make kind of fun of JavaScript for being very fashionable and having lots of frameworks and, and all the rest. But the thing about JavaScript is they're so welcoming to new developers and new users. And it's so wonderful to see it. And, and it's something that folks like Sarah should be super proud of, right? Um, anyways, so. I just wanted to point out, we should be wary about how people want to take this amazing thing with just open source and close it up. So they'll take things not covered by the license and use that for control and to add additional restrictions on their open source projects. Like, uh, you know, for a long time, patents weren't even mentioned in most licenses and now they are. Um, but one thing that most licenses don't address is trademarks. So let me give you some context. Uh, last year alone, uh, 
Googlers open more than 150,000 pull requests on more than 70,000 repositories on GitHub. It doesn't even count the thousands of other repositories we work in outside of GitHub, where we host major projects like Android and Chromium. Now that's a lot of open source contributions. And because of that sheer size, we tend to hit uh, problems in open source faster than many. In our office, our open source programs office, we get to use these experiences to help everyone in the open source community, as well as Google. Uh, and with trademarks, the problem we hit is that people shipping the software, they need explicit permission to use the trademarks. And this is an unaddressed problem in the licenses. So we recently got together with some key open source contributors and computer scientists to create the open usage commons, which, going, which is working on creating um, trademark guidelines that conform to the open source definition. So let's ask a question. How can you tell if a project is really open source? So uh, let's talk about forking. One of the most powerful things about open source licenses, the real ones, and how you can tell a project is actually open source, is you are able to take that software, fork it, and go your own way. I've heard people threaten to fork projects. People threaten me, that, like, I'm going to fork this project if you don't do this thing. And I always respond the exact same way. I said, that sounds fantastic. You should totally do that. And it sometimes catches people by surprise. A lot of people have this notion that forks are super, super negative but forks are an incredibly important, healthy uh, part of open source software. Think about it. So, so the way I think about this, okay, is every time you ship something to a user, a customer, whatever, that's a fork, right? Because you're basically, you're, you're, you're putting a flag in the ground and saying, okay, we're, we're, we're gonna ship this thing, right? It's off the main trunk, it's somewhere out there and someone's relying on that branch, right? So you just forked software, congratulations. Um, and, that means you're probably going to come up with new features and new tools to work with that fork. And that's super neat. And here's the great thing about open source li software licenses. You can do that. And I think our projects become stronger and healthier for that innovation. And it's how we, we stay relevant with our users. The other reason that forks are not a negative end all be all is that open source licenses allow these projects to come back together, that they merge the fork back in. So we had this happen with Linux kernel and Android. There was a time in Android's history, and I know this is going to be super shocking to everyone who's ever used a cell phone, where battery life kind of stunk, right? And Linux and, and batteries were in this sort of terrible relationship. Uh, Android needed a way to tell the kernel, to tell the CPU to mellow out, to, to, to not come out of the low power states too aggressively, and to use less battery. Uh, now, at the time, this wasn't actually of much interest in the upstream kernel community that was largely concerned with server workloads. Um, but Android users really, really needed this. So we forked the kernel. Um, and some people were super upset about it. And I, I remember telling them at the time, listen, we're going to come back together in a couple of years. And we're going to merge the best of both worlds. And we're going to move on from there. So, and, and that's exactly what happened. It took about two or three years. But then wake locks got pulled into a, a new kernel structure that allowed for this kind of power management. And you know, because we were able to fork the kernel and then bring that back into Linux, we now have some two and a half billion devices running Linux and Android. And that's incredibly powerful. And that was only possible because it's really an open source project that you can fork and innovate with. So uh, so it's really an honor to be talking to you today. It's an honor to be in the open source community. And I'm really grateful to be talking to you today. So if you remember nothing else from this talk, remember this. Uh, the open source license is all the permission you need. Uh, with an open source license, you can build the project you want, the community you want to be a part of, and work together with others. So keep that at the center, fork stuff, and have fun.